This is the place you come, where you can dance and scream and be with your own kind, and where everything is possible. But how do I get there from here? When I was your age, you either became a boxer, footballer, or a pop star. I'm going to be a writer. I know the impact a great book can have. Starters, I'm going to be a rock critic. I have an interview for the job. I'm Johanna Morrigan. <laughs> then I'm going to totally transform myself in nine pounds forty-eight. Good God, it's a child catcher. Nice one, babe. And then there's the arrival of the beautiful boy. Tell me about you. I went on a plane today for the first time. Is this turbulence? No, we haven't taken off yet. <gasps> We don't employ little girls to write our newspaper. What? <laughs> to mental girls from council estates. Oh God, what do I do? You are the unstoppable force. So, don't stop. I come from urban hell and I describe rock and roll. A nice girl gets nowhere, but a bitch can make a name for herself. Kill, Time for your kill, first blood, kill, darling. Kill, kill. This is horrible. The kind of music testicles would make. Who is this bitch? When did you lose your mind? Tearing apart records for the music press. It's not you, is it? No, it isn't. You look like an Olympic swimmer in a bathtub. <laughs> oh, here yes. she comes. What do you do when you build yourself? Build up and tear down. Till one day you'll just you. Hello and welcome to another Curse in the Living Room event. If you're watching this live, you can join the conversation either in the comments on YouTube or via Twitter with the handle at Curse and Cinemas. And please use the hashtag how to build a girl. How to Build a Girl is an adaptation of Caitlin Moran's hugely popular 2014 novel, an often hilarious semi-autobiographical account of teen life in the Midlands and the early 1990s music scene. To talk about that film, I'm delighted to welcome Caitlin Moran and director Koki Gedroich. Hello both. Hello. Hello. First of all, congratulations on the film. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Oh, thank you. Um, Watching the trailer again, I'm like, we made a film. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's got in the Thompson in it. Hurrah. <laughs> um, we've already had a lot of questions from audience members. I'll come to those shortly. I'm just going to open with um, a few. Um, Kathleen, acknowledgements at the end of a book are not normally the most interesting things uh, to read. Yours opens with the most incredible sentence. Writing a book is literally worse than giving birth to a baby in hell, then dying, then being brought back and having to have another baby. That this time is coming out of your eyes, even though your eyes aren't holes and there's no way a baby can uh, come out of them. Um, it sounds like writing the book was a terrifying experience. Um, was writing the screenplay less painful? Yes, hugely much. Well, less mentally painful. Physically, all writing is painful because what no one ever tells you about being a writer is that your bum hurts almost constantly. It just requires a lot of sitting on a chair and not moving. So my main, when people ever ask me advice about writing, I'm always like, just get the most comfortable chair you can. Everything else will be easy after that. Um, but yeah, no, writing the screenplay, because I knew what was happening. I knew the plot. When I was writing the book, I had no idea what was happening to those characters. Every day I'd sit down and be like, what are they doing? That seems a bit weird. Don't put that in there. <laughs> and how long had you been thinking about adapting it? Um, well, I when How to Be a Woman came out, which was the non-fiction memoir of my life, I got a lot of people asking me if I would make a film of it, but there wasn't really a plot to that non-fiction um, uh, memoir that I'd written. And uh, But I really wanted to make a film, so I wrote the book in order hopefully to be able to write a film so I could so I finally was writing a book that actually had a plot that had a story that you could hopefully turn into a film and astonishingly that happened it's only now I realized how unlikely it is that you're ever going to make a film I mean making a film is such a huge privilege and deal like it costs so much and you have to involve so many people it's such a hoo-ha um so yeah I realized how lucky I was <laughs> Koki you came on board quite early in uh, the process I gather and um, can you talk about the, the whole adaptation process? 
Yeah, yeah. I came I came on board, um, I guess it was about a year before we started filming. Um, and I met Catelyn. She was a massive hero of mine. I loved the book. Um, I was super nervous to meet her and kind of realised actually that my main job on this entire project is to sort of be a conduit for her voice. Um, and obviously it's always like that as a director. You, you know, you're, you're working with the text and you're working with that original story. But I felt, and I still feel with Catelyn, it's it's so kind of, um, it's so much more important than that because it's so present and living, her writing, and it's about politics, it's about young people now, it's about how a young girl perceives herself when she looks at herself writ large on a screen. I and mean, it felt, it just had an added kind of um, challenge and kind of responsibility actually coming on board. And so it you know i got the gig and that was amazing and we spent a year together in the basement of our production offices and we just wrangled that screenplay catlin writes really fast she's incredibly collaborative and i would come i'd swing in and say and also bonnie our producer was there too she's amazing and so the three of us just literally pulled this thing in all directions just to sort of see how visual a scene could be or how tiny a scene could be or how a new character might throw something up and it was that wasn't it Catelyn it was like a really organic thing well it was magic because I was in the room with people who knew how to make films and I didn't like I'm just words 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 and so Koki was just so good at just repeatedly going remember this is going to be on a screen like you can make things happen as well it doesn't all have to be about the words and it takes yeah. a while to get your head into that because i'd always just been writing prose before but she'd be so good at just looking at a new scene and going either this will work or this won't work or here's how we could make it work or here's what i'll need to be doing on the day where we shoot this what else can you do that would make that even better and that was such a thrill to just have such clear advice like to not people mistily going we just make it better koki was able to go specifically if you do this here it will work better here and you'd be like that's great. Someone's telling me what to do. Thank you. <laughs> it was so much fun. It was quite madcap, wasn't it? I mean, there were moments, there were hilarious moments where, because Catelyn writes really, really fast and is very generous with her writing, you know, we'd say something like, could you just add this one little note, you know, that might even just, it might, you know, one little scene might fix it. And Catelyn would come back and the whole script would be rewritten, the whole thing from beginning to end. <laughs> I didn't really understand at the beginning of the process what it meant when they said, if you could do another beat here. Like the, thing, the first time they were like, could you do another beat in this scene? I went away and wrote, I think another three scenes. I introduced this whole new character uh, yeah. that had a whole backstory that was going to weave all the way through it. He had a big musical number. Um, uh, I think it was Roy the tambourine player who was going to be a waiter and stuff. And like, no, you don't need to invent Roy the tambourine player. It's just literally, I wanted two lines. That's all you need to do. Like, I'll put the musical scene back in the box then. That's okay. There's also that thing with um, when, you, when you're writing comedy for the screen, the, the beat is so important that something that reads incredibly funny on the page becomes mm. a very different beast when yeah. you're actually acting it out. Totally. Yeah, if you're really, really laughing, if you're pissing yourself laughing on set, then you're in trouble, I always think. Because it's so forensic. It's so, it's so, so delicate, that thing, that kind of like, the tonal thing and finding those beats of humour. But again, you know, all the way through filming and through the edit, Catelyn's, Catelyn's kind of collaborative thing. And actually all of us, don't you think, Catelyn? All of us, the producers, we were all just a gang kind of trying to make it as good as it could be. And it everyone, was... Yeah, no, everyone really believed it. It was a very sweet project to work on because like, because it was such a female dominated process. We had three female mm -hmm. directors, we had three female producers, female director. Our cast was mainly female. The crew was very female. And there are so many issues in it. Just, you know, we've got menstruation, masturbation, sex, sex not being bad. Uh, walking into a sexist environment like all these things that if you were working with a mainly male crew and cast you'd have to explain it to them but every woman on that set got it and it prompted a lot of conversations people talking about their first times bad experiences they'd had so it felt like a little quest we were like a little gang going yeah you know here's a list of things that hopefully you've never seen on screen before and we're going to give it to all these girls in the world they're going to finally see themselves on a screen in situations that they know about and hopefully that will be amazing for them and the well, actually, sanitary towel. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, please go ahead. I was going to say the sanitary towel became the kind of the most feminist thing that I probably have ever done in my whole career. 
<laughs> yes, get so that thing on screen. Yeah. So there's a scene where Johanna's um, uh, doing PE uh, on her period and she does a roly poly and her sanitary town falls out, something that most of us have had some kind of similar experience to. And there was a huge conversation about how, what the sanitary towel should look like, like kind of how much stainage there should be on there, uh, what day it would have been. I was sort of pro the fact that it wouldn't be the first day of her period because she would have like skived off if it was the first day. So it must be towards the end where it's all a bit more rusty and uh, <laughs> minimal. So um, so that was a big, intense intellectual debate about how much stainage there was on this sanitary towel. One of my favourite days in my career. But again, you're, you're, this brings us back to talking uh, about the comedy and the beat because I watched that sequence where she carries out the perfect... Uh, gymnastic exercise and when everyone starts laughing I thought it was they were in shock that she did that so well and then we cut to yeah. the floor yeah. and it, again it's one of those moments it completely threw me because I was expecting it to be something different well, that's so great that you got misguided on that because one of the things we were really keen on was to make sure that this was a character, a big girl, and that none of the jokes came from the fact that she was big. Like, it's yeah. sort of, you know, not to diss other people's projects or whatever, but like, you know, Rebel Wilson in Pitch Perfect, nearly every joke in that is about her being fat Amy. And like, you know, the, the girl's body shapes and sizes have changed so much. And I just really wanted to put a girl on screen who was big and beautiful and confident with it. And none of the humour came from people either teasing her about it, making her feel bad about it, it or her making self-deprecating jokes about it she's just there she loves herself and she wants you to love her as well it's so um, it's so radical that it's so radical in a very very kind of um you know easy sort of light on its feet way just the i just the idea that no one even mentions it in the whole film just like no one mentions that her brother's gay it's just not a thing it's just there it's bedded in the story and you know, our our job and our kind of like our quest was to make you care about them and, you know, love them, basically. But it also accentuates the cruelty of the guys in the hot tub when she overhears them talking about her. Yes. And that's the only time you hear it. And that's her big moment of revelation. But up until that point and after that, it's never mentioned. And that's that scene, the hot tub scene is basically all of the patriarchy having a party. It's the patriarchy party. And that's where you sort of see how she's viewed by sort of bad people and how she needs to leave that place. But that was very deliberate. That's the only time you ever mm. hear it mentioned. Um, I had a question about the Kill Your Darlings moments uh, from the book. I, this question has just come in from Superstar Sweetie. Um, mm -hmm. Love the book and film. Kathleen, was there any part of the book that wasn't in the film that you wish could have been? I was really sad that we couldn't. We tried several ways to try and fit in her getting an attack of cystitis, because as far as I'm aware, cystitis has never been covered by Hollywood. Another thing that tells you it's a male dominated industry, because had women been running it from day one, Gone with the Wind would just simply be mainly about the terrible societies that Scarlett O'Hara clearly would have suffered uh, in such a sweaty environment. So I, I was gutted that we couldn't fit that in. Um, I, think that was, I think that was the only one. Catelyn, we can save that for the sequel. Yes. A massive, massive scene about cystitis. <laughs> yes. How to Build a Girl 2, sitting in a bathtub and crying. I'm up for writing it. <laughs> Um, can you talk about Beanie Feldstein? Because obviously a, a lot of people will have seen her from uh, Lady Bird and Booksmart. Um, to yeah. me, she wasn't, when I, I found out that she was uh, playing Johanna, she wasn't my natural choice, but she's brilliant in it. She was, she, she came to our attention in Lady Bird. Basically, our producer, Alison Owen, said, um, you know, I don't know what you think, guys, but I reckon we might have found her. We'd done we'd done a big search. We'd um, we we were auditioning uh, all sorts of girls from you know starting in Wolverhampton, and then kind of the the, the circles got wider. And then um, we watched Lady Bird, and she's just luminous. You know, she just has this movie star quality, and she's holding our movie. She's in every single scene apart from a few, um, and yeah she's the heartbeat of the whole thing and so it was it was actually it I know what you mean but it was kind of like a, a visceral thing when we met her she came over we we did we had a couple of days with her we screen tested her and she just wrapped her arms around it and she just lights up every room she goes into she she brought a whole layer to Johanna that we knew was there but she kind of switched it on and it's about her kind of love of life her absolute pure optimism. And that's that's in Catelyn's writing, you know, but it just needed illuminating. It needed kind of like filling out and it was Beanie. 
this is one of the things I was so lucky with because like all the way through the writing process, um, all the producers and Koki were so enthusiastic and just going, do whatever you want, make it as big as you want, go wherever you want with this. And it was only when we'd finished the script and started casting that I realised that I'd written an almost uncastable role because she's in nearly every scene. She has to go on this massive journey from being like this sort of like sort of quite shy, weird, clever, funny teenage girl with her plaits and her glasses. And then she's got to go to London, reinvent herself as this massive flamboyant bitch and then go through some kind of sort of process of realisation and come back to the end again. And that's a huge stretch for an actor to play, particularly one who is supposed to be 16 at the beginning of the movie. And uh, and we were just lucky enough that it takes so long to write a movie that in that time, Beanie had had time to be born, go to Broadway, get all this experience, go in Ladybird, and was at that point ready to be a leading lady. But like at any other point in history, I just don't think we would have had a big girl who could play that young, who's so charismatic and full of joy and can hit every single one of the things that we gave her. So uh, that was another another moment of astonishing luck. So did you take her on a grand tour of all your local haunts in the West Midlands? It was so annoying. I was on a book tour in America when she was over here. Um, so she and she moved to Wolverhampton for two weeks. She uh, worked in a gift shop. Uh, she made loads of friends. And she was saying that since she stayed in Wolverhampton, it screwed all the algorithms on her computer because she keeps getting emails kind of going, there's a two for one curry deal tonight at the restaurant around the corner in Queen Square. And she's like, I'm in L.A. I don't think I can take advantage of it. <laughs> She was so game on, Ian. She, we, we, we got her this job, and actually, she was more nervous doing that job than doing the movie. She, she was really scared to go in and, and sort of, you know, work the till and speak in a Wolverhampton accent. <laughs> and after that, everything was a breeze. Another thing that I think really helps with the development of her character, as well as having this internal monologue, um, the inspired idea of having Johanna's wall of inspiration with the best casters. I love the fact you've got really famous people in each of those little characters and they only speak for a couple of seconds throughout. Um, that is just a brilliant idea. Oh, well, thank you. Well, it was it was one of those, it's after I'd had a conversation with Koki where she was just really trying to make me realise that like the words and the dialogue is great, but you've also got the screen. And she was like, always like, think visually, think visually. And when I finally got my head around this, it's like, okay, what would my eyes want to see if I was watching this movie? And it's, all of my current day heroes playing my heroes from the past. So we've got Sharon Hawken playing Joe March. We've got Mel and Sue playing the Brontes. We've got Lucy Punch playing Sylvia Plath, Michael Sheen playing uh, Sigmund Freud, Jimmy Jamil playing uh, Cleopatra, Cleopatra. Allen playing uh, Elizabeth Taylor. And they've all just got these brilliant little vignettes because one of the things I really wanted to do was write, I love coming of age movies, but they usually are about a girl who's got girlfriends around her. It's all about the gang. And that's great. But so many girls in their teenage years don't have that gang. They haven't found it yet. And I wanted to write a movie for lonely girls who haven't found their squad. And what you do if you're a lonely girl is you've got your heroes. They are your squad. And every teenage girl has a god wall with their heroes on it. And the idea that they would come alive and give you the advice that you needed in your head because you have no friends to give you advice. It was that was one of the moments where I was like, okay, I now get why making a movie is so addictive because you can come up with these kind of ideas and Koki will make it happen. I've got a question. Yeah, we, oh, go on, please. Sorry, sorry. We just love the idea that girls go girl, well, you know, anyone watching the movie would, would sit would sit, watch it and kind of see the aspirational kind of hear it. So it's like, you know, it's your God, but it's also someone in real life who is really cool as well. It was sort of double. It was like a double you know, treat. Treat. it's a yeah, it's a complete luxury. It's just like, what is the treatiest thing you can give your eyes and soul at this moment? And that was just that was one of the greatest joys seeing that happen. Like that's that was one of the great thrills of my life. I was like, this is fun. I want to keep making movies till I die now because you can do this kind of stuff. I've got a question from Helen from Brighton. I know you both have daughters. Did you try any of the material out on them? Um, what has been their response to the film? My daughter loved it and now she wants to wear a top hat. She's 13. Aww. Oh, well, warn her because what I what we realised about a top hat, so we give Beanie's uh, character a top hat in the movie because that was what I wanted the most when I was 16. I wanted a top hat. But oddly, jumble sales in Wolverhampton don't have that many bold chapeaus. Uh, so I never got one. So we gave Beanie's character one in order to fulfil my teenage dream. And it was a nightmare because they just fall off. You've got to try and get the hair in it. Like when she's at the gig and she's dancing and we are basically having to staple it onto her head and nail it onto her. So just warn her in advance. They are not as easy to wear as you would think. There's a reason why most people don't tend to wear top pants these days. 
And with um, my daughter, Ian, with yeah. my daughter, she was a massive fan of the book um, when she was 14. And she kind of, it was like a clandestine thing. It was like a little, you know, secret that she and her mates had that they were reading this quite rude book that, that they loved. And um, so when I invited her and all her mates to come to a screening of the film, they were literally sort of beside themselves because it was sort of, it was a sort of hero worshipping thing with Catelyn, but it was also just, oh, just that they saw themselves on the screen, you know, seriously, literally for the first time. They were just kind of, they were being seen, they were being noticed, was what they was what they said, and they, and they're all a big gang of fans that are kind of going to grow up and and read books and stick with it basically, which is brilliant. Whereas for my teenage girls, it was more of a mixed grill, grill because obviously they want to watch coming of age movies about teenage girls. But the one thing that would make them not want to watch that movie <laughs> is if it was about their mum. And in it, you saw that your mum having a wank. And then oh, yeah. it's just you don't want to know. So, um, so yeah, they, they only watched it very recently and they came in and they went, that was quite good. But we don't want to talk about it. And then left the room again. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you about that. Did they really? Yeah, no, they were like, they were like, we're so proud of you. It was, we really enjoyed it. We laughed, we cried. It was fantastic. We loved it, but we never want to talk about this again. <laughs> Draw a line. Draw a line. <laughs> I say, I've, I've actually lost a bet at this point in time. I was chatting with a friend and I said that I'd be talking with you both. And I bet them that within the first two minutes, the word wank would come up. And it's actually taken us about 18 minutes to get there now. So I've, I've lost my bet. God, um, I've lost my touch, literally. <laughs> usually it's in there in the first minute. I usually open with her. It's the first page. <laughs> Um, I've got a question from Amy from London. Um, oh, on the subject of which, there's a lot of sex and masturbation in the book, as well as Al's big penis. Um, did you cut most of it, not Al's penis, generally the sex, because you thought it would be too much for the film? Oh, no, we were very pro having as much as possible, weren't we? That kind of... Yeah, we really, really were. And um, it was just, it was a kind of process of talking to our American, you know, co produced thinking about the audience in America, testing the film. It was really interesting that, um, you know, young people who we thought would be like, bring the sex on, bring it, all of it, we want it all, were the ones that were actually kind of going, let's go gently here, weren't they, Kathleen? They were sort of yeah. saying, actually, we want to know, we want to get to know the character and then, then we're happy for it to get a bit leery. And so we were listening to all of these, you know, responses to the film and navigating it but we fought for the things we really really wanted we had absolute like here are the bottom lines and we stuck with that and it's 98 percent what we wanted isn't it wouldn't you oh, say God, yeah no totally yeah i mean big owls big penis is still in there so yeah. you know on a, when, when you sign off on a project where, where a man with an unfeasibly large penis is still in it you know you've done quite well yeah and the sanitary towel yes <laughs> and the wank yeah i mean yeah, wank. we covered a lot of ground there um, I've got a question from Kate. I'm 15 and I read your book just before seeing the film. I think it's brilliant. If you were to start out being a writer now, how would you do it? Oh, mate, I don't know. I don't know if you want to be a writer, Kate. It's it's difficult because I was so lucky. Well, mine was the last generation where we had the music press and sort of, you know, I, I depict the music press as it was, which is quite a sexist place uh, and quite difficult to work in as a teenage girl. But nonetheless, it meant as a working class teenage girl, you could start writing somewhere at the age of 16 and be paid for it for day one. And of course, all 16 year olds now can write, you can blog, but you won't get paid for it. And uh, and it's interesting, one of the um, sort of one of the reasons why I was really in interested in making the film is when I was a 16 year old girl and writing for the press, I was probably the only 16 year old girl in the world who could write her opinions and have them read. And I went through a very familiar journey of starting off as a fan, having explained that like, no, you're not supposed to be a fan, you're supposed to be more cynical and attack the bands and then realizing that's not what I'm like at all. I want to be a fan again. And of course, now every 16 year old in the world has the kind of platform where they can write about their opinions. It's social media and they tend to go through the same journey, which is you start from social media like, hello, here I am in my bikini, he's my dog. Then someone's horrible to you and you start attacking them and they attack you back. And then at some point you have to go, no, I don't want to be horrible. I don't want to be cynical. I can't dance in armor. I can't grow in armor. I want to go out there and be joyful and, uh, and undefended again. And so the sort of, uh, it, it, the story is the story of any teenage girl who wants to communicate in the world. And the bad news is you won't get paid for it like you did in the 90s, but the good news is anyone can do it now. 
Um, on the subject of uh, being positive, obviously the, the relationship between Johanna and, and John Kite um, is key throughout. I've got a question from Miles in South London. Um, he, he asked you to talk about the music choices that were made for the film, but also could you talk about who inspired you to create John Kite? Well, that was another thing I was really keen to do because all the rock star characters I'd seen in books or on TV or in movies before just weren't correct. Like when I was a teenage girl and interviewing these bands and touring around with them, the usual rock star that you see in movies is like leather trousers, sunglasses, bottle of Jack Daniels, just a bit leery and horrible and a bit thick and a bit unpleasant. And all the boys I was hanging out with weren't like that at all. They were all really brilliant working class autodidacts who would sit in the pub with me and play Scrabble and treated me like a sister. So this was the era of like Teenage Fan Club, the Manic Street Preachers. Um, and so he, so John Kite's based on sort of a combination of Teenage Fan Club, Manic Street Preachers, and Guy Garvey from Elbow is another one of those working class boys who is just like a big brother to girls. And I love the idea as well, most coming of age movies. If you see the hot boy at the beginning, she's gonna get off with him at the end. That's the arc and the prize. And I was like, no, I wanna see a movie where you see the hot boy at the beginning and he becomes her friend at the end. Like that's the story I haven't seen. And I think that's a far greater treasure. And Alfie Allen was so amazing as John Kite. And he sings a song that we got Guy Garvey from Elbow to write for the movie. And that was, that was his first day on set, wasn't it Coke? And he just nailed yeah. it, it was incredible. Yeah, he and he sat, the the take that we kept in the film is the live take, so he's really singing it for real there in that space, and um, you can hear the nerves in his voice, which I love, because it's just you know it's just him, him there, you know. There's no artifice to it, and, and I wanted to add, Catelyn, as well. We talked about the kind of, you know, that the classic kind of you know usual rock and roll heroic figure they're always they're always very very sort of tall and willowy aren't they and they're always kind of a little bit upper class and stuff yes. and they obviously can't play the instruments and I don't know we just wanted to move so far far away from that in our story yeah no my only sadness is I asked I begged Alfie to put on a couple of stone because obviously John Kite in the book's quite big but he'd just come off the back of playing um, a Nazi in Jojo Rabbit and uh, and he, he couldn't be a fat Nazi apparently. So I was I kept telling him how to put on three stone in two weeks, but he uh, he declined my diet sheet. <laughs> Damn that tiger witch eating! How dare he spoil know, your right? film? <laughs> He's still really feet on the ground though, isn't he? He's super super grounded. It's great. Oh. Well, I thought he was going to be really rock and roll. I was a little bit scared of meeting him. And uh, he's just the sweetest boy. He's such yeah. a darling. And all my Welsh friends say that he nailed the Welsh accent. Like kind of, that apparently it's an incredibly hard accent to do. And he's so spot on. He's, um, I was so pleased when he said, I'd wanted him to play John Kite when we were talking about casting. They were suggesting various people. And I was like, no, it's got to be Alfie Allen. I saw him at the Glastonbury Festival once, very drunk, but still acting with enormous dignity. And that's my John Kite. Plus he's really fit and hot. And there was a silence. And then I remembered that Alison Owen, one of our producers is his mum. And I basically just perved her son to her. And that's probably not that professional. <laughs> yeah, he was brilliant. I, I've got a question from Jenny from Birmingham. If both of you had to pick one gig that you attended in the past above all others, what would it be? Oh, God. Oh, wow. That's really tricky. Um, oh, Christ, that's so hard. Um, the best gig I think I've ever seen was uh, Africa Express, which is Damon Albon from Blur's World Music Collective. They played a secret gig at Glastonbury about 10 years ago, and it was uh, Norman Cook, Fatboy Slim, uh, Maradou and Ariam, uh, Aliens. It was like this super group, and they were coming up with the songs live on stage. Damon was just shouting out chord changes. They were getting these grooves going and improvising stuff, and that was, I was right down the front, hysterical, just going, this is everything I've ever wanted. I had drunk a lot of cider, but that was probably my best ever gig. <laughs> what about you, Koki? I spent the whole of the 80s as a groupie for my um, boyfriend's band. And he was a saxophonist and he was in a in a kind of um, glam rock band. And they were the best gigs, I'm afraid. They were little. They were in scuzzy old clubs all over the place, all, you know, north of England. We managed one gig in New York and they were called the Mystery Girls. And they, they were just the best times. Small, Actually, perfect. Uh, Kathleen, I, I went to um, college in Birmingham around the time that um, the film is set. And I, it was a joy to see Edwards Number 8 being referred to. Yes. Um, what was your favourite venue in that city? 
because oh. I know there was the Hummingbird as well, which I went to a lot. But Edwards Number Eight, I loved. Yeah, no, I loved Edwards Number Eight. The barrel organ, which to get to from the train station meant that you had to climb over two dual carriageways, and I was always doing it in a very short skirt. So there would just be a bit where you'd be kind of running through the traffic and then climbing over the central division in a really short skirt, trying to keep it pulled down over your knickers as you climbed over, trying to get to the gig. I quite like the kind of Horace go skiing, will she live, will she die element before you'd even got to the gig. You sort of you turned up there high on the fact that you'd survived. <laughs> I have a question from Sarah from Guildford. Um, did the Scooby-Doo a TV appearance or something like it actually happen to you? And second, second question, will you ever uh, return to Race by Wolves? Oh, bless. Oh, well, first of all, yes, the Scooby-Doo thing is pretty much based on the true thing. It happened to me on radio. I was 13 and I rang in a phone in on Radio WM, the local radio station for the Midlands. And it was about, it was around the time they were talking about banning certain breeds of dog because there'd been quite a lot of dog attacks. They called them devil dogs. And one of the breeds they were talking about banning was German Shepherds. And I had to rescue German Shepherd dog at the time. And I was like, I'm going to ring in this phone in and say that dogs are great. Um, and I was kept on hold for a very long time and gradually started to lose my nerve. So that when they finally went, and now we're going to Katie in Wolverhampton, what have you got to say? And I went, I don't think you should ban dogs. Dogs are lovely. In fact, my dog's my best friend. We're like Shaggy and, Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Dooby-Doo! And then the man just, I just heard a click. And then I heard on the radio in the kitchen, well, that was Katie from Wolverhampton. She appears to have lost her mind. Moving on. And uh, it was a very deeply traumatic event for me. <laughs> Um, I've got someone called Silk Spectre um, sending in a question. Uh, what was your experience premiering, uh, premiering this mu uh, movie in 2020? Um, a difficult time to say the least. Yeah, well, we were lucky because we got to go to Toronto first, didn't we, Cokes? And that was amazing. Toronto was absolutely incredible. It just feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it, Catelyn? Oh, God. So we went to the Toronto Film Festival in, was it November of last year? And uh, that was like the worldwide premiere. And uh, it was extraordinary. We sort of, we watched the whole thing. And then I just didn't know what to think. And then it finished and there was this standing ovation and they were taking us up onto the stage, me and Koki and uh, Beanie and Alfie. And I could see everyone's hearts beating underneath their shirts. We were all just freaking out. And there were people down the front crying. And it was, I mean, I'm so glad we had that one moment in front of an audience before we got shut down. That was magic, wasn't it? Yeah, they were so receptive and they were like they were queuing around the block. It was an amazing thing. And then and then everything shut down and we, you know, everything shrunk. And we decided that actually to premiere it online and to go, you know, to go on Amazon Prime was was the right thing. It was it was absolutely the right thing because we really felt that people needed a film like this, actually, at this time, that it's uplifting and redemptive and kind of like funny and and it's just it's just a great antidote to everything so we went for it and it was a it was sad not to be you know on the marquee wasn't it I mean it was sad not to see the name name in lights but well, I was glad I didn't have to wear uncomfortable shoes on the red carpet and also I'd always been pro streaming because like generally I suspect most of the audience for this will either be women of our age having a kind of nostalgic moment about their 90s teenage years in which case for them to go to the cinema you've got to get a babysitter you've got to plan it blah, 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 or teenage girls who want to watch the Naughty Rudy movie and again for both of those audiences to be able to sit at home and watch it on your tablet whenever you want plus eating the snacks that you want and going to the toilet when you want I'm, I'm all about the comfort and snacks so this is the the premiere comfort and snacks experience we did we did talk about it didn't we we did actually you and i talked about it kind of separately going this yeah loads of loads of our target audience are going to want to come and see it yeah. on the screens together at home so it worked i, I hope it worked yeah Seems so just handily a pandemic helped us to uh, to achieve that that brilliant dream <laughs> I've got a final question from Liz from Manchester. I've just finished reading More Than a Woman. It's brilliant. Will you continue to dramatise your life on the small or big screen? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, the next film I've got planned, uh, I've got, well, I've got the next three films planned. And uh, I think the ladies are going to like the next one. It's, uh, it's about women finding it difficult to find suitable boyfriends. Uh, and they can't, don't want to nag men anymore to improve and they're bored of going out dating. So they start making perfect robot husbands instead and then it goes wrong. So, and I had a previous experience where I made a robot husband and it went very wrong. So yeah, I'm going to continue to dramatise every single thing that happens in my life. <laughs> um, How to Build a Girl as well as uh, being available on Amazon is now playing on Curzon Home Cinema. And Kathleen's most recent book, More Than a Woman, published by Ebury Press in September, is available to buy in shops for just one more day. And then for the next month, you can buy it online. 
Um, thank you so much, Kathleen and Koki, for joining us today. Oh, Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And also good luck because you've got the whole night ahead of you of writing. So um, I hope yes, it's, that, it's a good night. elections come along on a, on a, yeah, I've got a premiere and an election to deal with. One of them gives me ultimate joy and the other one is giving me terrible fear. I'll leave you to guess which one's which. Good luck. Thank you both. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so Take much. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And just to let you know, the next Curzon Living Room event takes place on Thursday, the 12th of November. The I think we're, are we going back to live? I'm not sure. <laughs> oh. Can you hear me? Hello, um, I think we um, just had a problem with wrapping up just then. So just to tell you one more time, uh, the next Curzon Living Room event will take place on Thursday, the 12th of November. Jason Solomons will be in conversation with the novelist and screenwriter of The Winter Journey, Martin Goldsmith, the final film of the great actor Bruno Ganz, and its screening as part of the UK Jewish Film Festival. So that's on Thursday, the 12th of November. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Bye bye. Hi. Hello. Hello, is anyone still there?